Hello, and welcome to the latest Expert Series webinar. Today's webinar is Raising the Bar on U.S. Equity Investing. This is a complimentary ETF.com webinar, courtesy of Vidant Financial. I'm Ali Ludwig, the managing editor of ETF.com. We are the leading authority on news and data about ETFs, and the company behind Inside ETFs, the world's biggest ETF conference. Joining me today are Nick Stone Street. He's the co-founder and CEO of Atlanta-based Vidant Financial. Nick spent most of his career at Merrill Lynch, and most recently was a VP at Regions Private Wealth Management. I'm also joined by Ted Lucas, the founder and managing partner of Lattice Strategies, a San Francisco-based investment firm focused on risk management. And with Ted, also from Lattice, is Mark Thomas, the managing director of Lattice Strategies. Mark has responsibility for developing strategic relationships and helping lead the firm's client solution and product strategies. Before we get started, I'd like to, everyone to know that uh, you can ask questions at any time during the webinar in the lower right of your screens. We will have a Q&A at the end of the formal presentation, and uh, I may chime in with some questions along the way. Today's webinar takes us to a very exciting crossroads in the world of indexing and exchange-traded funds. My guests from Lattice will be speaking about their expertise in risk management and in risk-weighted portfolio construction. It's an idea we've been hearing a lot about in the ETF traffic in recent years, and with a partner like Viden Financial, we'll be hearing a lot more about it for sure. Viden came onto the scene last October with the launch of the Viden International Equity Fund. It trades under the symbol of VIDI. The fund gathered hundreds of millions of dollars in a matter of weeks, and it now has about $680 million in assets under management. Then earlier this year, Vidant launched a U.S.-focused counterpart to VIDI. It's called the Vidant Core U.S. Equity Fund. It trades under the symbol VUSE. We'll call it VUES for simplicity's sake during this webinar. This newer fund, VUES, now has almost $65 million in assets. As I said a moment ago, Vidant finds itself at an interesting crossroads in the world of money management. And that is to say that it has managed this impressive asset gathering feat in a number of ways. Firstly, it has made common cause with Ron Blue and Company. This is an RIA based in Atlanta that steered a significant amount of client assets to Biden's first strategy, VIDI, and almost uh, 60 million now in the case of views. Welcome to the world of bespoken ETFs, as we call them here at ETF.com. This is a relatively new trend in the world of ETFs, wherein investors are lined up before an ETF even goes live, and Biden Financial is one of its leading beneficiaries. But the Biden story is a little bit more detailed than that. The funds that it's offering are very much in the realm of what we call enhanced beta. This is a vibrant pocket of the fund universe in the world of indexing, pioneered by the likes of Rob Arnott, over in Newport Beach, California, and Wisdom Tree Investments down in New York City. To put a finer point on it, the indexes Biden uses, which were developed with Lattice, screen for a number of factors you won't currently find available in other strategies. Within its, within its international strategy, these factors include growth conditions, monetary policy, economic freedom, and governance. Its U.S. strategy considers corporate governance factors such as financial reporting quality, board composition, and other ethically-based leadership factors. Those growth and ethical considerations dovetail well with the values of Ron Blue, which is a large clientele, some of which explicitly identifies itself as Christian. Biden itself isn't Christian per se, though there is clearly an ethical meeting of the minds here in terms of their respective values. And with all the excesses we witnessed from Wall Street in each recent years, it seems like this could be a virtuous partnership. So let's get right into all the details of what Biden calls principles-based investing. We'll start with Nick Stone, Street CEO of Biden. Nick, take it away. Great, Ali. It's great to be back with you. Thank you uh, for having us back. Um, we'd just like to quickly go through, through the agenda for today's call. We'll talk just for a moment about Biden, a little bit about principles-based investing, and then really get into the meat of the discussion on the risks associated with U.S. equity investing and, and perhaps shed light on a different approach to U.S. equity investing 
and talk about solutions and then open it up for Q&A. Vident uh, is a Latin word that means we oversee, we care for, and the structure of Vident is a bit unique. It's owned by the Vident Investors Oversight Trust, uh, so we don't have any um, interested uh, shareholders of our company. We have one shareholder, the trust, and, um, and we all work uh, day in and day out for the benefit of our investors. Um, so this is a, a very liberating way to run a company. And Vident really focuses on principles-based investing. And as we think through uh, different principles, really time-tested uh, time principles, we've uh, crafted them into an investment framework and really look at the sources of wealth creation and use our principles as a lens for how we construct investment solutions. And we also make sure that those investment solutions are uh, um, risk-balanced and have a, a real uh, view on a rules-based process. So we take out the human emotion. One of the keys as we go through and look at uh, principles is that uh, these six principles, and I'll go through them very briefly, applied wisdom, I think we'd all consider that an uh, important principle in investment construction, that we have to take what we learn to create situations of asymmetric risk uh, uh, in the solutions we create. We also think through of uncertainty, and I'll link that with the last one there, instability. We, you know, we, the environment that we live and work in is uncertain, kind of like the weather. It changes. You don't always know what it's going to be. And instability, which I would uh, say is less like weather and more like an earthquake. And so we don't know uh, the future. We can't forecast the future. And so we create solutions that we, pro we believe provide uh, resilience in the face of uncertainty and instability. Then uh, key for us are human productivity, which we'll talk a little bit more about, and leadership and governance, uh, which we'll also talk a little bit more about in the creation of, of the solution. And lastly, inherent value. You really have to buy at the right price. Um, you really have to understand the uh, intrinsic value of an investment and not just chase returns. So these are the, the uh, core economic and investment principles that guide our uh, investment solution construction. Just to go a little bit more uh, deeply into the principle of leadership and governance, and this really gets to the heart of, of this U.S. index, um, we believe that corporations with higher standards of leadership and governance are going to uh, significantly influence productivity. So we really want to look at um, corporations that encourage uh, productivity uh, of their employees. And that we think that that leads to a more fertile ground for investing. And the other uh, key to this, and you'll see this woven throughout the construction of this index and, and views the uh, solution, the investable solution on the index, is um, the general characteristics of good governance. And what do we mean by this? Um, it really comes down to two basic areas. One is, is leaders who understand that they don't own the company, that they're stewards of other people's investment. And any publicly traded company should absolutely have this view, but we've seen a lot of bad actors who consider uh, the, a, public company, a publicly traded company as their own personal piggy bank. Um, the other thing, too, is having accounting honesty and um, integrity with the way that they lead and the way that they're governed and exhibiting some humility. Um, in, in the way they submit themselves to uh, the, the leadership of their uh, board as well. So we'll get into some of that. Uh, we'll Nick, uh, can, can I chime in really quickly uh, about this uh, leadership governance screening that you're doing? Uh, can you tell us a little bit how that uh, shapes the research and the investments uh, before you carry on? Yeah, I think um, the way that it shapes the research and investments is, is and Ted will go into this in more detail, Ollie, is, is it really we, we look for the worst actors. Um, and if you, if you look on the next page, um, it's, it's actually we've got some of the worst actors that uh, we can remember and, and see how these companies would have been screened out. What we found in our research as we were putting the solution together is that if you can remove kind of the worst of the worst, um, uh, you're able to significantly enhance the returns for investors. And these are just a few companies that we're all aware of, Tyco, Bear Stearns, 
AIG, Lehman Brothers. And as we go through and, and uh, further talk about this, you'll see how um, the screening out of the bad actors uh, comes into play to enhance returns. Thanks for that question, Ollie. If we could, let's go to uh, the next slide and just talk a little bit about the risk problem that we're, we're uh, trying to address. So this uh, Bident US, um, core U.S. equity strategy was really designed to look at a, a few different um, issues that, that we really think are created um, by cap weighting. Uh, if you look at, first of all, that cap weighting has a, a disregard for important principles-based risk um, in expense recognition, financial reporting, and corporate governance. And, and you know, we're not um, here to just uh, talk about uh, cap weighting. I mean, cap weighting has been very successful for a long time for a lot of investors, and we have huge uh, respect for John Bogle and some of the other pioneers of cap-weighted ETFs. However, we think that by embedding factors within our solutions that we can get more out of them by just having a simple one decision index. So we look at um, different factors in companies. And then also we think that in cap weighting, there's a lack of valuation discipline. And so cap weighting really emphasizes the equities that have, have appreciated, but it's not really forward looking. And then concentration at the company level, if you look at a S&P 500, 10% of the S&P is comprised of 12 companies. And so you get these concentrations of mega cap companies when you're buying a U.S. cap weighted equity solution. So this is a little bit of the design uh, problem that we wanted to address with our index. Uh, a quick question, uh, Nick. Um... Is there a, a, a clear correlation in the in the literature uh, between um, good governance and, and long term uh, uh, financial uh, returns? Part of the design, and and um, let's go. Could we go to a governance, corporate governance, and re leadership research slide? This is this is a really good question, Ollie, because we really. Um, spent a, a lot of time in design of this index doing research um, on these governance factors. And there's three studies in particular that I point to that really um, enhanced our, our view uh, of governance. One was by Lipper which, uh, in 2004, which showed that companies that had uh, higher standards of corporate governance uh, performs uh, significantly higher as well. We'll, well. We can make that research available uh, to uh, to your audience. The other one with Moody's, I think this was an important study in 2005. It showed that that firms in the top 10 percent, with uh, of the firms in the top 10 percent, with those high unexplained bonuses and options grants, experience dramatically higher default rates. So um, this is really key because when executives have the power to pay themselves, even when there's a lack of performance, uh, you, you often see companies start to fail, fail. It's a real indication that there's too much power with the executives. And, and the Harvard study that we reference as well, I think this is another important um, factor that we looked at, and it's CEO pay slice. And in this study, it doesn't, it doesn't say that the absolute dollar amount of a CEO's pay is problematic. It's the dollar amount of a CEO's pay in relation to the other executives, in this case, in particular, the CFO. And so the, the CEO, where they really uh, take a huge portion of the pay slice relative to other executives, again, it shows uh, characteristics, perhaps, of an imperious CEO. Um, that has too much board control over the compensation committee and perhaps uh, too much uh, control in, in other areas of the company as well. And so in that Harvard study, it showed that by uh, overweighting those companies in the S&P 500 with good shareholder rights and underweighting the bad ones, it led to an 8.5% per year excess return. So yes, Ali, we've had... Um, uh, Good documentation and good studies on several of the, on really on all of the factors that we've 
uh, baked into this index. So, so can you shed a little light? I'm sorry to keep interrupting here, but uh, what what uh, what is Biden doing with all these findings? I mean, clearly, uh, it doesn't take a long time to remember a lot of the shenanigans that we witnessed in the past decade and a half or so. Uh, what do you how do you uh, integrate these findings into what you're up to? Well, you know, Ali, that's that's the key, right? Is that um, you know we're not in this to be a research institute. We're in this to create principles-based investment solutions that are investable to the everyday um, investors and to help provide um, advisors with tools so that their clients can have these exposures. And so uh, in creating the uh, VIUSX, the index, we really had to uh, look at this in a few different ways. Uh, one, we wanted to make sure that we rewarded the companies with uh, higher qualities, and Ted will go through and explain exactly how we do that. We wanted to have uh, the right combination of the, the different factors that we talked about and, and harvest risk premia from those uh, factors. And then we wanted to make sure that those exposures are balanced, um, risk balanced. Just as uh, many of the, the people on the line may be familiar with VIDI, the IDI, the international um, uh, ETF that we launched back in October, uh, this has a very similar kind of uh, construction from a risk balancing standpoint, which I think investors will come to appreciate more and more over time. In particular, if we look at some of the, the key factors, and I won't go through them too long, too, in too much detail, but we use uh, loan accounting quality um, as a very important factor, executive compensation balance. We talked about that a bit. Uh, board member can, commitment, we really want to avoid uh, overboarding. Board members that, you know, sit on six or eight boards that aren't really focused on the business at hand that are taking paychecks, uh, maybe because of their names or their prominence rather than their true diligence on the boards. Um, performance pay quality, uh, this is important for us. Female directors, um, this is one that's very interesting because it, what our research showed is that when you do have uh, women on uh, the boards, that it gives more of a balanced view, and there's actually less um, uh, risk-taking within the uh, context of the companies, and we've, we've gone back and back-tested. It's very interesting, the findings there. Uh, growth quality, we, just, we don't want companies that are just growing by acquisition. Uh, there's a lot of uh, potential for accounting issues when there's a, a high percentage of growth uh, through acquisition, uh, legal and risk management, pension liability funding is another one, and asset efficiency ratio. So we look at all of these factors and we're able to um, combine them in a way that we feel gives us a very successful screen to move out the worst offenders and include um, the, best, uh, the best actors in a more pronounced way. If you look at this next slide, I mean, this is interesting. And, in retrospect, uh, we would have screened out the four com companies that we mentioned earlier. So you can see the points of uh, um, when, we, when we move out the bottom 20%, and again, Ted's going to go through that construction, that all four of those would have been uh, screened out of our index based on the back test and the rules engine that we put into place. There's many, many other examples that we could point to. Um, and let me say this, there's some good companies that we'll screen out too. There's some companies that have grown through acquisition that uh, have done extremely well. There have been some successful Imperius CEOs uh, that have done very well. But overall, we, we look at this combination of factors and we just don't think it's worth it to keep uh, a few of the good companies in uh, us with these characteristics because usually it doesn't end well. I want to turn it over to Ted Lucas from Lattice Strategies, and he and his team are really the key architects of this solution to walk through how the solution is constructed. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, as with the, the international equity strategy Biden launched uh, last year, what we worked to do here was create a very systematic rules-based approach of implementing this strategy. Uh, so just to walk briefly through the different layers of the, of the rule, rules-based process that get us to the, the output, the portfolio uh, character, characteristics that I'll talk about briefly, uh, we start uh, with 
uh, universe construction where uh, the liquidity and the, the market cap cutoffs uh, for this product, 500 million minimum market cap, a million and a half average daily trading volume over the prior six months. Uh, that's the starting universe. Currently, that represents about 2,200 companies, uh, and it's typically been been in that range. Uh, the next layer of the process is to bin all of those companies into their respective uh, industry sectors. So technology, financial services, utilities, uh, telecom, healthcare, et cetera. And the reason we do that is when we apply some of these governance and, and principle-based um, uh, scoring of, com of companies, we want to make sure we're doing it on an apples-to-apples -apples basis. So as an example, if we're looking at uh, female board representation, the manufacturing sector versus, say, the healthcare sector, we want to make sure we're comparing like for like, so healthcare company versus healthcare company, uh, just given that there are uh, meaningful differences between the sectors. So we start with this universe, approximately 2,000 or a bit more uh, at this point in time uh, eligible stocks. The first step of, of the process is in each of the 10 industry sectors to take the composite scoring of the companies based on these factors that Nick just walked through. So we're not going to penalize a company based on one of these factors alone, i.e. executive compensation um, or uh, female board representation or even uh, loan accounting quality, but we want to get a composite view uh, of the quality of the company according to these, uh, these principal factors. And what we do there within each of the 10 industry sectors is remove the bottom 20% uh, worst offenders, as Nick said, uh, companies that, that score most poorly along these, uh, these dimensions of uh, accounting quality, um, and governance, and financial reporting. So let's work with a, a tangible example uh, to continue through the process. We use the technology sector um, just as the, the point of representation. And we'll just say that there were 100 eligible, eligible stocks to start with based on the, the 500 million minimum market cap and a uh, million and a half average daily trading volume. We've got the 100 stocks. We're going to remove the, the bottom 20%. So we're now left with 80 eligible stocks within the technology sector. The next layer of the process is to distill that, to seek to uh, distill that universe down to the thirds of the stocks that we believe best embody what are, uh, in our view, sustainable risk premia factors. Things like valuation, uh, momentum, and then other quality measures like gross profitability. We also uh, want to reward companies that have particularly good governance and good accounting uh, quality, good expense recognition. So that is also taken into account where we want to, uh, again, uh, reward companies uh, along those lines. So what we're doing here is reducing now the, the 80 stocks in the technology sector down to the, uh, keep the math simple, the 26 or 27, the, the top third that, in, that embody the combination of these different risk premia factors. And again, the idea there is try to concentrate in the names that where you have the good governance, you have the different uh, principal uh, scoring aspects um, being, um, being positive, but then also make sure that we're not overpaying, make sure that sentiment around the stock with respect to momentum uh, is, is relatively positive uh, against other uh, stocks in the sector, and then again, uh, other quality factors like profitability that we're, we're also rewarding that. The next layer of the process is we've got our, call it 26 or 27, stocks in the technology sector, now how are we going to weight them? So as Nick alluded to, in cap-weighted indices, uh, you end up with uh, not only concentration at the stock level across the whole index, but particularly within subsectors uh, and sectors. Technology is an example where if you were to invest in uh, a technology cap-weighted ETF that focuses on that sector, you have a very large Google position, a very large Apple position, a very large uh, now Facebook position there'd be very significant concentration where the top five names, uh, including Microsoft, let's say, and IBM, are going to uh, represent upwards of 60 or 70 percent of the exposure. So what we did here was say, let, let's approach this in, in, a, in a more rational way that attempts to diversify, and let's, let's not do that on, a, on an ad hoc basis, such as equal weighting. Let's weight the uh, companies within the sectors according to their risk contribution. 
And as with the, the international equity strategy, we use tail risk. We're not using volatility or, or uh, a more uh, blunt statistical measure, but, but tail risk contribution. The idea is we want to balance uh, tail risk so that each uh, company in each sector is contributing an equal amount of tail risk. And what that means is a, a far more even distribution uh, across the, uh, the companies in the sector basket. So we've done that now across our 10 sectors. We've got our, um, our, our basket. It's been risk-weighted. Uh, and then the sectors themselves, we, we intentionally did not want to introduce um, sector tracking risk into this. We, we believe that the screening on principles, the risk premium factors, and the risk weighting, those are really the three drivers uh, of enhanced return enhancement and risk-adjusted return enhancement for the strategy. Uh, so deliberately, we did not uh, introduce uh, sector risk. So we hold the sectors at their, their cap-weighted uh, representation. So if technology is 15% uh, of the overall U.S. market, it would be 15% uh, in this portfolio. And doing that results in the, the, the final portfolio. Typically, we'll have uh, along the lines of uh, 400 uh, to 500 stocks, depending on the, the size of the starting universe. And then, again, the process layers here, they're systematic. They can be run repeatedly on a, on a rules, uh, using the rules engine. What, what then we are concerned about is, did they achieve the underlying portfolio characteristics that we were uh, looking to uh, distill? So once you've, you've done that, we use the, uh, the MSCI USA uh, IMI index uh, as the closest uh, universe to, or the closest uh, stock coverage relative to our own universe. Uh, so that's the top 2,500 names by market cap and, and represents uh, about 99% of the free float adjusted market cap in the U.S. And what we're doing here is simply co contrasting the composite scores for the MSCI USA IMI index in the uh, gray bar, shaded bar, and then the composite scoring along these dimensions for the, the portfolio uh, for the Biden U.S. core equity index. So loan accounting quality, asset efficiency, pension liability, uh, funding, legal risk management, we see improvements. So generally, the, the, com the companies on a composite basis in uh, this index uh, are more proactive in writing off bad debt. They're getting more efficiency out of their assets with respect to turnover. They have a lower uh, uh, discount rate uh, assumed in their pensions to determine their pension liability, and there's less litigation and less compliance risk. You can move to the next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so we are also looking at these other uh, measures that we've talked about. Growth quality really refers to the, the organic ability of the company to grow versus just purely being an acquisitions machine. And while certainly companies can succeed uh, doing that, uh, the research that we conducted found that there, those are typically more outliers in a company that does not have organic growth potential and has to always be reinventing itself by doing acquisitions, you don't have as sustainable growth. So the growth quality is higher. The executive compensation balance, that's the pay slice that Nick talked about, where, again, we're trying to ensure that the CEO is not taking a disproportionate uh, share of compensation relative to other senior management members. Uh, board member commitment is this, this idea of overboarding, where we want to make sure that the board members who serve on each company's board are not overcommitted. Uh, to, to serving on many other boards and are taking their uh, responsibilities as fiduciary seriously. And performance pay quality is this idea that the, it, it looks very likely that the executive who is being compensated by the board is having a high degree of influence over what his, comp and his or her compensation is. Uh, we're trying to reduce that, that risk. So you get these improvements. Then we look at the, the valuation, uh, the composite valuation uh, against the benchmark index and uh, uh, portfolio here, or the index uh, for the Biden U.S. equity, uh, core equity uh, index. And on a, uh, on a trailing price earnings basis, uh, a bit higher currently, although on a, on a forward basis, uh, lower. And again, the fact that there's a valuation discipline that's very heavily built into the, the risk premium component of the process ensures that we're not, we're not overpaying. If you look at these other dimensions of valuation in terms of price to book, price to sales, price to cash flow, dividend yield, uh, there's actually an, an improvement. So the portfolio on those grounds uh, is more fairly valued uh, than the index, and we think that certainly uh, will uh, influence future returns looking forward if we can maintain that valuation discipline. 
And then finally, this idea of concentration. We want to manage risk, and uh, I mentioned the, the concentration issues you see at the overall index level within, within sectors. By virtue of this risk-weighted approach that we use, uh, referencing uh, the Biden U.S. Core Equity Index against MSCI uh, USA IMI, you can see significant reduction in concentration in top 10 exposures, top 25, top 100 exposures. Uh, and that is certainly one of the key uh, principles that we're trying to um, enforce here, which is to say there is uncertainty, there's instability. We don't want to take a significant bet uh, on any one uh, portfolio component to drive returns. We want to make sure that we are uh, being wise about what companies we hold, but then weight them in a way where we're not, uh, we're not concentrated. Yeah, and I think, um, Chad, thanks for, for that description. You know, one thing is our top ten really doesn't look like uh, anyone else's uh, top ten, and you can see the weightings, again, showing the deconcentration. So I think that, that tells a really good story, just as with the international equity solution, uh, where, where we have much lo uh, lower weighting to developed markets and more into emergings. In the same way, this uh, solution has uh, uh, more evenly distributed uh, weightings. Let's go to the next slide. So um, one of the things that's really key in this construction is that we maintain the uh, sector balance. And um, so while our sectors look very similar uh, to the MSCI or, or S&P sectors, then, um, but the thing that we really didn't do is uh, when we created the solution, when we put the factors together, we really were very much uh, indifferent to market capitalization. We were looking for the best factors in the portfolio. We were not looking for how do we distribute market cap. So you see market cap with uh, uh, the VIEW6 is, is very different. Um, so only about 3.2% uh, in mega cap and 29% uh, in large. 32 mid, but if you really think about it, you've kind of got a division of a third, a third, a third in large, mid, and small. And again, that was not by design. This is just the way that the factors uh, shook out. Um, but we did think it ended up with a very interesting uh, construction. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah, so we all know back tests, and um, Ted is smiling at me right now because when we first we did not retrofit the factors to produce this slide. So when we first went back and ran the back test and, and did this, we, just, we actually had a discussion as to whether we should ever even show this or not because it, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, yeah, it's a very positive slide. Let me just leave it at that. But this is the back test. This is how the factors that we put into place uh, back tested over time. And um, if you look at the index year to date, uh, since, since inception, you're already starting to see the index move uh, versus the S&P 500, even though small cap is taking kind of a hit. And even though the index is weighted a third towards mid and a third towards small, it's still uh, ahead of the S&P um, year to date. So very interesting that we're able to harvest kind of this smaller capitalization premium, value premium and combine these factors, um, you know, frankly, we just, I mean, we all honestly believe that we built a better mousetrap, and that's just the way it is. So, um, yeah, go ahead, Ollie. Nick, yeah, uh, I was going to ask you about that. I mean, it, it's, it's, there is a lot of complexity, it sounds like, uh, and, and you're showing this, this compelling slide there. Um, I mean, what's your elevator pitch? You know, how do you tell someone, you know, in, in those, 15 important seconds, what is this thing, you know? Um, how, how should an investor think about it? What's, what sliver of the portfolio should this occupy uh, for them? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Ali. This, I think the way we should be positioned is a, an all-cap U.S. equity portfolio that seeks um, uh, factors that have better, uh, that seeks factors in companies that have better uh, governance, better leadership, better accounting honesty, um, and so this is, uh, this is the design. And we really do believe this is a core U.S. equity position. It does cover all caps. Um, 
You know, if you were a foreign investor and you wanted to own one U.S. equity fund to fill out your portfolio, I would say own views. If you're a U.S. investor um, and you and you understand the factors and understand the story and believe the story, then use views as your core U.S. equity exposure. Why would you have a cap-weighted S&P 500 or another cap-weighted index? Use this as a core U.S. equity exposure and then build around it. Um, with satellites, you know, either opportunistic or defensive satellites. So this is exactly how Ronald Blue and Company is now using uh, the the uh, views um, fund is as a core exposure and building around it with uh, satellite exposures to be opportunistic or defensive. Thank you. So, um, and by the way, in that chart um, over that same period. Uh, the S&P would have done about 27.4% um, in S&P 500 fund. So I'll, I'll just, uh, this is Ted, just, um, I'll try to do this in 15 seconds. This is a quality product where quality is measured in a far more uh, rich way than a typical quality type portfolio. It is then uh, combined with a very strong value discipline. So you have quality and value uh, done in a, in a, we think, very unique way because we transcend some of the traditional quality metrics. And then you have this tail risk parity element to diversify the portfolio. So what you're really doing is combining uh, three primary um, process inputs. And so there might be complexity in running those, but in, in thinking about this uh, as an investment exposure, that's what we're trying to do. Get great quality, define it differently than others define quality, we think has more efficacy have this very strong value discipline in place so you can extract that premium and then be intelligent about how you diversify the portfolio so you don't have this concentration. Right. Now, one of the questions about this, so so what you just said, that, that was Ted, wasn't it, uh, just speaking just now? No, that was Ted. Yeah, so quality plus value, that's, that's, that's a useful way to think about it. Now, um, one of the things we hear about uh, in, in, in the press traffic, the journalistic traffic, is, is that uh, these Biden – solutions might be too expensive relative to other passive funds and and the question is how do you how do you counter that what how do you address that client objection if you will hey mark why don't why don't you take this one yeah sure happy to um, you know this there's a slide here that we can probably pull up to explain some of, of how this uh, strategy should be viewed in the marketplace vis-a-vis -vis other solutions we can pull up um, if we can advance one or two there. Um, so so the look, we, we play in, in the ETF space. This, this particular index is available as VUSE um, as an ETF. And, and how does it compare to what else is available? So we know what's been available in the past. Passive beta has been around for, for quite some time. And all the efficiencies and that the advantage packaging of an ETF have really popularized those strategies. Um, everyone on this call likely knows them very, very well. And certainly smart beta has, has come on scene as well. These tend to be uh, reweighted uh, based on a single factor, single criteria, whether that's dividends, some fundamentals, volatility, or other. And you still get the same advantages of the ETF packaging. What we're talking about in this strategy is something a little bit different in that it's got multiple process layers. As we've said, it's got the, uh, you know, the initial screen to improve the overall universe of available companies. It's got the, uh, the risk premia factor-based stock selection, and then it's got the risk balancing at the sector level. So it's an overall multi-process layered systematic uh, product, or a strategy rather. And it, it fits right between uh, kind of the reweighting type of options that are out there and the traditional active. All of these are rules-based, systematic, and codified, but, but as you can see, Ali, there's much more embedded in the strategy which uh, really, I mean, this at 55 basis points is, uh, is quite, uh, quite a value. Yeah, and Evan, jump back to slide 21 just for a second, um, not to belabor this, but really? So, um, you know, we get compared a lot to uh, some of the really um, inexpensive beta uh, solutions. And, there, and look, there's a great place for cap weighting and inexpensive market exposure cap-weighted solutions in, in a portfolio. So we're not down on them at all. Um, 
we do think that in this ETF universe that there's room to do more. Look, an ETF is a very agile servant, and we're um, pushing the boundaries of what an ETF can do. We're embedding intelligence into the ETF in a way that, you know, few people have done uh, before. And, and, you know, collectively, our brains are worth 55 basis points. So, uh, yeah, it's, I always kind of bristle a bit, Ollie, when we get compared to a one-decision uh, inexpensive beta uh, 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 solution. So, yeah. So just a, a little bit more on that point, uh, uh, how should investors think about this? It, it, it's, it's, okay, 55 bips, you're saying that's totally justified considering everything that this thing does. Uh, it is uh, a little, little more expensive uh, from an expense ratio perspective than a lot of smart beta. Um, I'm not saying it's in the uh, realm of active, uh, actively managed mutual funds in terms of expense ratio, but it begs the question, how does an investor think about this? relative uh, to the pricing issue. Yeah, I think that's exactly right, and that's why that slide on, on 22, Evan, if you click there, is exactly how people should think of that spectrum. You know, if you have a, a traditional active strategy, I don't know, traditional U.S. active strategy is probably 75, 80, 100 basis points, um, and we fit right between a, you know, kind of uh, 40, 35, 40 basis point smart beta solution and a 75, 80, 100 basis point active solution. That's where we believe um, our solution fits. Mark. Can you repeat that one more time, Nick? I'm sorry, just to make sure that, that, that that's clear. That was an interesting uh, uh, breakdown there. Yeah, that, you know, if you look at the at, at this slide and you kind of price it out, you see the passive data and, you know, some of those are down to three basis points as people are having price wars on S&P 500 kind of solutions, and then the smart betas, you're, you're finding the U.S. strategies and smart beta, you know, 35, 40 basis points, and then we're at about, we're at 55 basis points, and then traditional active strategies are probably priced 75, 80, even up to 100 basis points. So we think we fit in a unique space with a systematic alpha strategy um, that, uh, yeah, I think really is a good value for the owners of the solution. Thanks for letting us talk about that, Ollie. Sure. Mark, you want to continue? Yeah, you know, I'll just sum up. Um, it, really, we, we talked about what the, where this fits in a portfolio. We do view it as a core U.S. allocation from which to build around. It, one of the uh, features that really places it there firmly is that the risk premium factors. Certainly, you're getting the, the principal's exposure, with, which that fits uh, a centerpiece of a portfolio to begin with, the high quality. And then the risk premium factors are also adaptable throughout different market environments. So this is a, um, this is a, a strategy that can perform, um, as Nick said earlier, throughout a variety of environments. And then uh, the risk balancing nature of the exposure to the companies underlying each sector uh, also gives it some added resiliency. Thanks, Mark. I think, you know, we can just sum it up that principles-based investing uh, gives the investors a framework and concepts that are we're time-tested. Um, we get the exposures to the corporations the way uh, Ted discussed, and, and we have the systematic rules engine that we appreciate so much that, uh, that the ETF allows, so that human emotions really taken out of, of our approach to uh, markets and investing. Um, and with that, maybe we could just kick it to uh, q and A. I'm sure we'll all read this disclosure in detail. So yeah, okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot, gentlemen. Uh, it's uh, certainly interesting stuff going on and challenging us to think about this in some new ways. And we do have time for questions, so thanks for leaving uh, that time. It's always uh, useful to get a little bit of nuance. Um, so one of, one of the questions, I mean, uh, what Ted said, I think I'll circle back to that, what you said earlier, Ted, about uh, the quality and value sort of description, that's very, to me, very pithy, and I want to hear more about that. But first, I do have a question. Uh, the the, the, um, the principles-based uh, investing, it sort of begs the question of, in, in, in that vein, how do, how do we think about these funds? Are these, uh, is, it, is this social responsible investing? Is it uh, uh, environmental, social, and governmental, uh, the ESG type screens? It seems like this, this these strategies, uh, Viddy and Views, are sort of traveling in different worlds, and I was wondering if you might uh, lay it out for us as far as how to think about it uh, through that lens. 
Yeah, I, I, it's interesting, Ollie. Thanks um, for bringing that up. The, uh, the, as we've gone through diligence with some of the, the larger uh, wirehouses, they've, they've put us into um, the ESG category. It's not something that we really sought out necessarily, and so we didn't build this with ESG uh, necessarily in mind. But we do think particularly in the, the U.S. equity solution, the screens around uh, government governance and, and uh, corporate honesty and uh, board governance and female directors on board, so many of those factors uh, do line up very well for it to be categorized as an ESG solution. It wasn't the intent, but um, it's, it, it, it does fit in that category. Ted? I, I would only... Uh, uh, make the point that it is uh, what you might call an, an agendaless uh, ESG or socially responsible strategy, meaning that uh, there wasn't a, a presupposition of uh, what you were wanting to exclude or what factors you were wanting to emphasize. It was all rooted in empirical research. So the factors that are being used are being used because we believe they enhance returns, not because of a uh, explicit um, agenda that we had. So the sort of the, uh, the chips fell where they may, so to speak, in all the research and all the many factors that we looked at to examine governance, we really tried to focus on the ones that work as opposed to, again, uh, selecting certain factors, screens, et cetera, based on uh, more of a viewpoint that can't be validated with, uh, with historical results. So, so when you say agendaless, you mean some some kind of a uh, overriding ideological approach to the markets, as opposed to following the numbers. Uh, you're looking at empirical stuff that that is going to deliver the returns over time. So in that sense, I mean, there, there is a, a very clear focus, if not an agenda, certainly a rubric through which to 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 uh, to organize a portfolio. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's more Ted, I suppose, right? Yeah, I mean, we're being it's more of being led by. Uh, those principles, and that's why we always start out uh, discussing those and um, let the application of those principles uh, take us to the destination of a, a solution that, we, that we're proud of and we feel, feel really great about. It, it, we don't presuppose to make any particular point uh, with the solution. You know, it isn't a solution that's for anybody, against anybody. It's just really a solution that is... Uh, led by principles, and, and we think it's landed in a really good place. Now, just to be really tangible about this, you were looking at, I think it was slide 21, where, where you sort of uh, sheepishly but proudly uh, talked about the back testing, where it was clear that this strategy was delivering the goods, uh, at least the, the way it was conveyed in that, in that graph. Now, to be really tangible, can, can we say as we look back at that, that, oh, the Enrons of the world, the Tycos, the countrywide. I mean, can you give us some examples of precisely the kind of train wreck that would have not been part of that portfolio at a crucial uh, moment in time? Yeah, Ollie, that's, um, when we went back and showed that slide with Tyco and AIG and the others, we've got dozens of examples. If you go through that timeline, we have dozens of examples of companies that were principles violators that we removed and um, or that the index rules engine would have removed, let me say correctly, and and that is a huge part of of the performance is just getting rid of the worst actors. It's, it's which is to say, removing them in time before before the actual cliff is uh, is driven off of or whatever. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Correct. There's warning signs either through imperious CEOs or through forensic accounting that put up red flags that would have. Rem that would have removed them or, or did remove them in the back test. And so, yeah, it's, um, you know, there will still be some in there that, that it doesn't always catch. It doesn't have 100% uh, batting average, but it really uh, did a great job of, as we went back and looked, of removing dozens and dozens of the worst offenders. And those worst offenders are the ones that really crash uh, your returns over time. Right. Now, w one question, and I guess this is a uh, question for you, Nick. Um, clearly, this Ron Blue uh, connection is, uh, well, uh, journalistically, as we watched it here at ETF.com, it was like, holy smokes, this thing is going into the stratosphere, and it's barely been like three weeks, and, you know, it turned a lot of heads. Uh, but one wonders, you know, 
is this a, a one-trick pony in terms of asset gathering? And I was wondering, you know, to the extent that this is an interesting strategy or strategies, if we talk about both VIDI and views, um, what kind of availability is it for uh, the RIA community, the brokerage community? Are, are, are you getting on different platforms? Uh, what does it look like in that regard to sort of make the access uh, very, very easy for, for those advisors who, who really want to look at this more closely on behalf of their clients? Yeah, Ali, but, you know, these were, as you mentioned, bespoke solutions created for Ronald Wu and Company and, um, and really to be part of their 10-year uh, long-term portfolio. So these are core long-term solutions. However, um, because they are publicly traded, they're ETFs, they're on the, both listed on the NASDAQ, um, they both gained outside assets as well. And so we've started to see more and more advisors that are not Ronald Blue-related uh, advisors start to use them. So we are actively working with uh, platforms for broader distribution. We think this is going to be good uh, for uh, all investors in these solutions, Ronald Blue investors and everyone else, because uh, part of the uh, Biden Investors Oversight Trust, one of the mandates is to drive down fees over time and to return excess profits to investors since we don't have a, a shareholder that's putting pressure for investment return. We really want to lower the cost of ownership over time. And, um, and so we do want to. We are going to more and more wirehouses. Just this week, Ollie, um, I was contacted from, by advisors at Ameriprise, at Morgan Stanley, and at Merrill Lynch who want these solutions on the platform. And so we do ask advisors to get in touch with us, and we're working through the chain of command because in some of these um, environments, the advisors are precluded from buying them and putting in portfolios. Others that are on the Schwab and Fidelity platforms that have free access to them are, are starting to include them as core holdings in their, uh, in their portfolio. So we hear from advisors that are not Ronald Wood & Company advisors on a daily basis and interact with them, and we want broad ownership of these solutions. And so, you know, I don't want to appeal to your audience necessarily, but if, if it's interesting and your platform doesn't allow you to purchase it, uh, let us know, and we'll keep going through the due diligence process and knock them down one by one. Yeah, before we uh, we uh, call it a day, I, uh, definitely include information where people could uh, get in touch with you. I think that's uh, that's very useful. A lot of the people who attend our webinars uh, like that kind of information. Uh, now, the, the good part about this bespoke status is that you got instant uh, uh, assets under management and and uh, liquidity is there. So in the trading traffic, um, it, it's got to be relatively um, a relatively easy pitch to make that this, this is not just some 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 security where you might just get killed when you try to buy it or sell it. Um, I'm wondering if you could shed some light about how these securities are trading and how that how it looks like from that perspective, because at the end of the day, it's uh, maybe a great wrapper, but if you can't get to it easily without some kind of uh, perilous trading uh, endeavor, uh, it, it, it doesn't look quite as good. So uh, I suppose that's a, it's a Nick question, perhaps? Yeah, you know, Ollie, we do spend a lot of time um, in New York with our uh, lead market maker, KCG, on both of the solutions, and um, we're very pleased. We watch every day. We track every day the volumes, the liquidity in the solutions. We haven't had any instances um, that have come to our attention where uh, someone's had trouble getting in or out. Um, we have an analyst that is watching the trades full time, and we want to make sure that, that uh, we're able to have the solution at a very fair price. So if you see the bid ask spread, They've been very reasonable. It's a little wider on the international solution, just because um, it's a you know it's a more expensive solution to create. So the create and redeem process underneath Viddy is is uh, very substantial. Um, but yeah, we've been very happy with the trading, the trading volumes. Um, no no complaints uh, from investors at all. And is KCG open to uh, to uh, working a big trade uh, uh, behind the scenes a little bit if they, if they encounter a, a super uh, super sophisticated uh, advisor who wants to 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 move some shares in, in size? Yeah, so um, KCG will always create more that you know as a lead market maker. They're always there to provide liquidity, and um, with the U.S. solution, we've seen a pretty tight transactions band around that solution on the. Re create and uh, redeem process. And so, yeah, uh, KCG is always there and standing ready uh, to create uh, more and create, they've created several blocks uh, uh, for uh, clients uh, already. So, yes, 
they, it's a normal part of their business, and they've done a great job for us. And as you know, um, Merrill and some of the other houses that trade for us as well have done a great job. Um, so yeah, we feel like just watching it day in and day out that the solution, the overall strategy uh, is behaving very well as anticipated. Again, it was just launched on um, January 22nd, I believe, but it's, it's behaved pretty much as, as predicted and then the trading of it has been tight. So yeah, we're, we're very happy with it. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Ted, I'm going to uh, ask you a question here. I indicated a moment ago that the your characterization of, of this views uh, screen as something of an amalgamation of quality and value is a useful way to think about it, and it certainly captured my imagination. But I'm wondering, I'm thinking about the slide. I can't remember what number it was right now, gentlemen. I'm sorry, but uh, where you compared the top ten uh, of, of views with, uh, I think, the top ten of a, of a large uh, uh, swath of, of U.S. equities. And what struck me is that the, the names were certainly recognizable on your top ten, and yet they're, as you indicated during your presentation, different. And I'm wondering if, apart from this quality and value um, type of uh, uh, factor tilt, uh, if there's perhaps industry tilts, are there, are there some industries that seem to have their act together when it comes to all these different screens that you have set up in, uh, in, in this index? Or, or is that a bit uh, too oversimplistic to, to look for patterns in that regard? In other words, is there a sector tilt to this uh, the security views that, that doesn't immediately meet the eye? That's for Ted. Yes, there, there intentionally is not a sector tilt. And um, again, the idea, at least our view is, if you're comparing even just um, known risk premia, such as valuation, uh, and to take a t simple example, there's a, uh, you know, a utilities have gotten very expensive, but let's just compare a utility uh, more trading in, you know, the 8 to 10 uh, range for PE multiple against a technology stock that the company is growing earnings 50% a year. To make a valuation trade-off call on that, it, it's not apples to apples. So when we look at the, the actual risk premium factors that we're using, different dimensions of valuation, momentum, uh, gross profitability, we're comparing companies within sectors to each other to make sure that we've got a more apples to apples comparison. Similarly, when you look at some of these principal factors with respect to loan quality, expense recognition, uh, the pr prevalence of litigation, uh, uh, board composition, uh, earnings quality, we're doing the same thing. We're, we're comparing companies against companies within each sector. Because as, you, uh, as you're alluding to, uh, Ali, there are certain sectors, and I'll use healthcare as an example. Generally speaking, healthcare has better governance, just to put it in a, in a very high level uh, frame, better governance than, say, uh, heavy manufacturing. Um, so again, what we want to do is within the manufacturing sector, the industrial sector, make sure we're comparing uh, the peer group against each other on all these principal factors as well as risk premium factors. Uh, and we, again, neutralize the sector tilts so that we're not getting distortions that we would get if we did not um, uh, uh, organize the sectors into the, the 10 groupings and do the peer group comparisons. OK, thanks a lot. That's, that's about all the time we have. Uh, that's it for Raising the Bar on US Equity Investing. This has been a webinar uh, sponsored by Vident Financial. Nick and, and Ted and Mark, thanks for, for being my guest. And, and, uh, I think the takeaway for me was that you're thinking of this as a core exposure security, and uh, that's that's something I'm going to noodle over. Uh, I wanna also want to thank the audience for attending and uh, for asking questions. Uh, again, as I said earlier, this presentation will be available to all of you in 24 to 48 hours, and you'll receive instructions on how to uh, obtain it in an email. Until next time, this is Ollie Ludwig, the managing editor of ETF.com, wishing you all a very pleasant afternoon.